go into a conversation like that, like not trying to be right, but trying to like get it right. Mm. Like try to just like understand who this person is. Welcome back to Happiness in Progress. I'm your host, Danielle Craig. I'm an Emmy award-winning journalist, a mom, wife, and you know what I like to say, just a person looking for more joy in the everyday. This podcast is brought to you by the Mail Tribune. You can find more podcasts at mailtribune.com. Today, you get to hear from Charlie Bird. He was Cosmo the Cougar at Brigham Young University from 2016 to 2018. He is an LGBTQ advocate. He is also the author of the best-selling memoir, Without the Mask. He hosts a podcast called Questions from the Closet and is currently in Utah pursuing a master's in social work at BYU. I think this conversation is so important because we talk about creating safe spaces for the LGBTQ community, particularly youth, why it's so important, how to be there, how to be that safe space. We talk about how creating that space, how being that person can literally be the difference between life and death. We talk a little bit about Charlie's experience coming out to his family and how their response helped him move forward and helped him to love himself, to accept himself. Charlie was really, really open in this conversation, and I think you will learn a lot, grow a lot, and hopefully, if you're not already, which you probably are, if you're not already, become that safe space for someone who needs it. Let's get to it. Charlie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, of course. I'm excited to be here. So I just want to jump right in to talk about why it is so important to have safe spaces for LGBTQ youth. And when I was thinking of this question, not only youth, because I have many adult friends who also need safe spaces. So why is that important to have that safe space? Yeah, for sure. So I think, you know, just statistically speaking, like if you look at any study, I mean, LGBTQ youth are up to five times more likely to attempt suicide than their heterosexual peers. And like, so so the, the one I'm referring to was done by the Trevor Project. It was a national survey on LGBTQ youth. And this came out like last month. And I was looking at the numbers and I was like, I was shocked, but I wasn't surprised. You know, like, like the number is jarring because mm-hmm. five times, like, like that's a lot of kids. Um, but like I said, I, I wasn't surprised because I, I know what it's like to feel outcasted, to feel isolated, to feel alone and feel like there's nobody that you can really open up to that would be safe the LGBTQ identity isn't readable. You know, there's not like strong physical factors that indicate different identities. Um, And so you really never know who around you could be gay. And I think that's what leads people to, you know, maybe say things or act in certain ways that can be harmful, not really knowing that there's like a minority identity around them. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about these numbers on Instagram, you shared part of your story and you talked about hating the pride flag. And within that, you said something like, I hated the flag because I hated myself. And it was just so heartbreaking to hear you say that. Can you take me and the listeners there to try to, if they have not ever been able to understand that, be able to understand that, that inner turmoil? Yeah, of course. So I I realized that I was attracted to men when I was about 14, like could have been 13, could have been 14. I was young. Mm -hmm. Um, Honestly, like in line with, with hitting puberty and like hormones start changing and attractions start developing. And I was like, Oh no. (laughs) And, and that realization for me was um, terrifying. It, It was, it was earth shattering. And immediately I felt like this strong sense of I am defective. And so there I am, I'm a a child and I'm I'm like, I'm defective. There's something seriously wrong with me and I can never tell anyone or else like, like, like who knows what could happen. It just didn't even seem like a possibility. Um, And so, you know, for a lot of years, I fought against myself and pushed back against who I was in the form of like, um, like religious scrupulosity and fasting and praying. And then also like, tried to use science, like psychological studies and like conversion therapy techniques that I was looking up online. I did everything to like combat this, what, what I consider like this monster inside me. Um, I, I used to write music. I still do sometimes, but I like when everyone was gone, I would sit down at the piano and write songs. And I, I have a couple of them still that I remember. And they're like, 
it's like some heavy stuff for for a kid to be writing mm-hmm. um and i think part of that was i was so terrified of becoming becoming gay air mm-hmm. quotes that i i actively pushed away everything that was even remotely gay mm-hmm. and i i became like i internalized homophobia and try to become like so anti-gay that I never would even let it into my realm. Mm-hmm. And so part of that, like I was like, I wouldn't listen to like gay artists or support gay anyone. You know, I had a really good friend who came out in high school and I like broke ties and stopped talking to him. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then the, like the pride flag was like the symbol of everything that I was running against. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like, loud and political and and it like represented sin to me honestly um and i was terrified of it um as i i grew up i, I went on an lds church mission came home i was expected to get married and start a family and like for the first time ever i had to actually confront this thing that i was running away from hmm. i thought it would leave by then but it didn't and i was like oh no <laughs> again like like how am i supposed to do this and I had to like turn around and square up to this, this enemy um, that, that I had just been running from and fighting. Um, when I did that, I realized that it wasn't an enemy. Mm-hmm. When I actually started looking at it and looking at me from like a more adult perspective, I, I started realizing that all of these parts of myself that I'd hated were actually like pretty cool. <laughs> Like mm-hmm. they were integral parts of who I am and they affected the way I communicate and the way I connect with people, especially the way I connect with, with women. Mm-hmm. And, um, I just stopped like demonizing myself and I started praying and instead of like praying for God to change me, praying for God to help me and just be like, Hey, what is this? And mm-hmm. like, how should I feel about it? And, and when I started doing that, like the this symbol that had our how had always like represented like failure to me started to represent hope mm. and it started to show me that there were other people like me that there were other people who were willing to support and so that yeah i guess that that symbol of this pride flag kind of morphed into something that is really like favorable to me mm-hmm Mm-hmm. Now that you're, as your Instagram bio says, loud and proud, um, how do you see yourself now? Because we just talked a lot about how you saw yourself then. How do you see yourself now? Yeah. Um, honestly, I think I mostly just see myself as myself. And and it took like a radical acceptance of all parts of me. But I, I don't know. I think, I think people get um, tripped up with labels a lot, especially... Mm-hmm like religious people or conservative, more like conservative background people. Are like, why do you have to label yourself? I'm like, really? Just because I need to communicate something. Um, but like to me, for myself and for the people who know me, I really don't. I, I'm just, I'm just Charlie. And there's elements of me, there's aspects that, that we use the word gay to describe. Um, but then if, if I'm like in society and someone's like trying to set me up with their niece, I'm like, no, I'm gay. You know, cause it's just a way to, to communicate this part of me. And it's so nice to like be able to accept all the parts of who I am and allow myself space and grace to think about what those are, what those mean to me. And then, and then use who I am to connect with others in an authentic way. Mm-hmm. And from a religious perspective, I, I feel like really good about where I'm at with God. And I feel a lot of love and acceptance and support from deity and that just instills so much confidence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, um, I also, I know you, I, I heard that you don't like to be called the poster child or whatever, but I love that part of you sharing your story has helped other people because this sounds like this is a really hard road, especially specifically in those beginning days where you have, where you had those feelings of, of hatred toward yourself how do you empathize with people who are who are there still yeah representation is is really important and it's something i did not have growing up Mm -hmm. so i I would look around and look for like healthy examples of of who i wanted to be and and there weren't any i i didn't really know any 
gay adults. And if I did, I was terrified of them. And as far as like gay members of my church, like non-existent, I didn't know anyone. And I, I saw like a direct correlation in my like healing when I started kind of like reaching out and reading people's stories, mostly on like underground blogs and people who were like anonymous, but like, hey, this is what I'm feeling, but I really love God. And I really love my family and my church. And like, I'm trying to make it work. Once I started like being exposed to other people and connecting with them, it was like, I guess I just didn't feel so hopeless or, or so like, um, like singularly broken. Mm -hmm. Um, and what, once I was like in a good place where my family was accepting, I was out, I was feeling good. I was like, you know what? I have the opportunity to, to give back and, and hopefully connect with someone, at least someone and be like, you know, this is where I'm at. This is what I've been through. If I've done some digging and some work, you can have everything I've, you can have it all. And then you can dig with me, you know, because, because it's, it's a tricky space and I don't know if anyone will ever like get it right. And mm -hmm. I don't know what right is for each person, but because representation was so important to me, I wanted to, like, I realized I had the platform and wanted to give that back. Mm -hmm. um, and you asked how to empathize with people. Um, I think I just have, like, I catch myself, honestly, having to remind myself of where I've been. Um, sometimes I look back and like this aspect of me was a totally different person. You know, it was, it was riddled with shame and insecurity and that's like really gone now. I've, I've burned a lot of that up just by being honest with myself. Um, but I, I feel like it's a really sacred space to take someone and meet them where they're at. And even though I'm not really there in like a self-loathing state of mind anymore, I have been there. I, I know what it was like to some extent and it, it makes it, yeah, the best word I can think of is sacred to, to go back with someone and sit with them in their pain and not try to fix them or not try to change it, but, but just be there and try to understand them. That's been really um, eye-opening for me. Mm -hmm. How can someone be there in that sacred space when maybe th maybe they have love and maybe they have support, but they don't understand? How can they move forward and create that safe and sacred space, even if they don't have the understanding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it takes a lot of brave conversations. And I, I honestly kind of think that's a skill you develop. Um, and, and I think you can be prayerful about it and you can be loving, but the ability to communicate differences and really find out who someone is, is, is a skill. And it takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of practice and it takes so much humility. And, um, so I guess the best advice I can give is to like, to go into a conversation like that, like not trying to be right, but trying to like, get it right. Mm. Like try to just like understand who this person is. I think a lot of times when we're afraid of someone, especially with like an LGBTQ identity, it's because we don't really see them as human. We see them as like an other, an other like that's happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you can kind of like move into one of these conversations and like really try hard to forget everything you've ever learned, forget all the stories you've made up about this person and all the assumptions that come along with whatever label they're coming out to you as, then you can really see like a bold, whole, like worthy individual. And then you can start there to build up a relationship that's really strong. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about how your family met you in that place? Yeah, definitely. So I really love my family. You <laughs> are awesome. so blessed. Like you have an amazing family. My family's literally so cool. Like I don't, I, I really am blessed. And, and sometimes, you know, honestly, I, I see people who struggle and um, I think a lot of times the difference is that I just had such acceptance for my family and like all of them were so graceful in the way they handled the news of, of me being gay. Cause like to them, it wasn't bad news. It was just like, 
it was just like more about me, you know? And they, they recognized that I, I, the same person I've always been, this wasn't like some sort of like choice or like thing that I was doing. It was just like, like, thanks for sharing this. Like, thanks for sharing who you are. Um, one thing that, that they did is there were a lot of what ifs. I, I've started talking a lot about the weight of a what if. Mm-hmm. And the weight of a what if is scary because your mind can go anywhere with that what if. And looking back, that's exactly what I was doing. And in terms of like, what if I, I tell them and the relationship permanently is damaged or changed? Or what if it changes the way they love me? What if I'm rejected? What if, and then from there, it just goes like, can go anywhere. And so like the, the weight of all that paranoia and insecurity was really, really heavy. And when I came out to my family, all of them did such a good job removing the weight of that what if. Mm. And in the first expressing love and then like a desire to like support me and root me on and cheer for me, no matter what my life looked like. Mm-hmm. And so like when I told my mom, I was like, okay, like what if she's uncomfortable with it? What if she doesn't believe me? What if things are awkward? What if she's really upset that I'll never have kids? What if I ever have a partner? Like, what about that? Like, ah. And she was like, it, I, she was like, I don't care what your life looks like. I want to be part of it. And like, I'm going to be there with you. Mm-hmm. And I was, she was like, I want you to be healthy. I want you to be happy. And I want you to figure out what that looks like for you. And like the, the weight that just like this backpack full of rocks that she just like cut the straps and it fell off of me. Like that was so liberating. And I think if we can remove that what if for other people, then we can really help them out. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. What powerful words from your mom. As a mom myself, whenever my kids are carrying a backpack of rocks, I don't care what it's about. I would want to be the person to cut that off. That's so beautiful. Um, What do you think? I think most often we see the disconnect between love and understanding and the LGBT community mostly when it comes to religious settings. Why do you think that is? I don't know. <laughs> like, that's been hard for me to understand, obviously, like, honestly. I, th- I think some of it is, um, there are, I-, I think there's like a level of threat that people assume. And, and, and I honestly have a hard time understanding it, but I met a lot with this idea of like, um, like gay marriage is like, like threatens traditional marriage. Um, and, and maybe I just need to talk. I should have one of these brave conversations with someone who like truly believes that to kind of understand where that's coming from. But for me, I'm like, if I have a partner, like, I don't think that does anything to my brother and his girlfriend or future wife, like, or Mm -hmm. like my sister and her husband. I'm like, I don't like, I'm not out here trying to like actively destroy their marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and like, I don't have a partner right now, but I just put myself in, in the future. She was like, if this happened to me, like, I don't know, like, like when my friends get married, like heteros- heterosexually, <laughs> I'm like, awesome. I'm so glad you found your person. Like, I love this. And like, I want you to have kids. Um, I'm wondering if some of that might be just like the misconception that like being gay is a learned behavior mm-hmm. and that it like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know where it comes from, but I, I, I do believe that if, mm, you know what, I just, I just realized something too. I feel like there's, there's like a huge attrition rate for LGBTQ people within religions. And so like, if, if you're gay and you're leaving religion, then there's not as much opportunity in space to get to know each other. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? And so, so I, I feel like that might have something to do with it too. Mm-hmm. Cause like for a long time, honestly, like coming out equals like leaving your church and mm-hmm. whether that be like a, an LDS church or any like Christian, non-denominational, Catholic, evangelical, like gay people aren't really religious cause they don't really feel accepted by the religious community. Um, so I don't know, there's a lot there. <laughs> any thoughts what thoughts do you <laughs> so, have? We, so we need a new uh, we need a whole new episode on this <laughs> i know
you know, I don't, I don't really get it either because I know a lot of very, very strong couples who are homosexual couples who have really, really beautiful, loving relationships, who, some who have brought really wonderful children into the world and they're, they're so happy together and they're strong and they're everything that I had ever learned about marriage and having a strong marriage. So I'm not sure what the competing, what the competing element is between the LGBT community and the religious community. What is, what do you, what is something you would want people who are not there and understanding yet to know? I really don't think that showing love and support is a compromise of moral values. And I think a lot of times people are like, well, I want gay people to know that I care about them as children of God, but I don't want to love them so much that they think I accept who they are or what they're doing. And I, I think that ooh, th- th- this is this is like a tough one for me because because it's out of like a desire to be Christ-like um, and, and like with true good intentions. But like in that mindset, in that process, there's an immediate like, if you're like, I want, I want to love you, but I don't want to condone. And, and I think we, we like, we circle in that sphere so much and it like doesn't work. Like, like if you're so worried about loving someone too much, you're not going to, I don't know. That's just like, that feels like a very rigid approach to love to me Um, and like a very fear-based approach to love. Mm -hmm. And I I kind of feel like a, like, like Christ, like, like, like the the Christ that I know and have read about was like so loving and um, like, like he was so loving that he was murdered because it was, it was shocking to the people of his day. Like he was with the the Samaritan and the leper and the harlot. And like, it, that, that's just who Christ was. And, and it wasn't like compromising his values. And he, I don't know, like, I don't know. It's so anyway, long story short, I think we get into this, like love the sin or hate the sin idea, but I, if you really get to know someone, get to love them, like they're not a sinner. They're, they're just a person. And, and I really would hope that we can at least just try that and like, like feel permission to, because like people are going to do what they want anyway, you know? And, but we get to decide how much we're going to be involved in their life and how much we're going to support them. How is being that person who's a safe space for somebody how is that the difference? But how is that safe space the difference between life and death? Well, statistically speaking, again, the, the same study that I was reading um, also says that just one supportive adult decreases the risk of a suicide attempt by forty percent. Hmm. And and again, so so we have like LGBTQ teenagers who are five times as likely to attempt suicide. And then on the other hand of that, just just literally one supportive adult decreases the risk by 40 percent and so like imagine two and then three and then four and then a family and then a community like belonging is 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 integral for for healthy societies for healthy individuals and if we can foster an environment of acceptance and belonging we we are all better and then at the same time like as we allow other people with different identities and different faiths and different ideas to be with us, I think we, we like grow, our hearts expand, our knowledge gets bigger. We understand more about how to communicate and how to build bridges instead of walls and like who God is. And I think as we foster that environment, uh, actually, I know as we foster that environment, like people want to stay in it. And we are in a, in a position right, right now where LGBTQ people don't want to stay in their environments and and the ways that they are not staying historically have been to either like leave and like cut themselves off from from people or to remove themselves from their environment through through suicide Mm. and like it's just unacceptable you know like 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 we can't keep doing this to people we can't we cannot keep doing that to people. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for coming on. The last question that I like to ask my guests, because this is a podcast about finding more joy in the everyday. What is your tip to finding more joy in the everyday in the good, the bad, and the in-between? My tip is to just like, like I, if you're being yourself, you're being the best. Like, like if you are, or I guess I'll, I'll bring it like personally, like when, when I am honest with me, myself, about what I feel, what I like, what makes me happy. And I'm just not ashamed of what that is. I'm so much happier. And so like, I spent a lot of time pretending to have interests. So other people would think I was cooler or like pretending mm-hmm. to have like certain friends. And I wasn't really happy, but when I was just like, you know what? I love to dance. So I'm going to dance. Then I was like, this is awesome. I'm doing what I love. Or like, I love to listen to this kind of music. And like, if friends get in the car, I'm like, yo, this is my, this is what I like. You know, I, I think that authenticity leads to happiness. Mm-hmm. I think you're right because I, I felt the very same thing. Charlie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, it's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. If you want to learn more about Charlie Bird, of course, you can read his memoir without the mask. I will link that in show notes. I will also link all of his information so you can follow him on social. Thanks for being here on Happiness in Progress. Mm-hmm.